This is WRFM on 98.2. A little something for the weekend. In 1692, 20 innocent people were put to death during the witch hysteria in Salem. I'm joined now on the line by Stacey Tilney, who is the Director of Communications at the Salem Witch Museum, where the memory of the innocent is honoured. Thanks so much for joining me today, Stacey. Thank you so much for having me, Rita. Well, firstly, could you tell us what 17th century Salem was like? So imagine uh, we are not our own uh, independent country yet. We were still a colony of England. And this this tension between our I- identity as um, Europeans and our identity as independent um, Americans, I think underlay a lot of the angst uh, that began the witch trials, but I don't want to jump ahead. What, what I want to make clear, obviously, is that it was a new and uncharted territory. There was wilderness just beyond, you know, the borders that had been yet developed. There were wars going on between England and France that were making their way over to uh, North America through Canada um, and incorporating a lot of the Native Americans, uh, which we call Indians at this time. And uh, so there was a lot of angst in a lot of different areas. And how did the accusations of witchcraft begin? Uh, in early 1692, January, so we're talking about the cold winter months, two young girls become inexplicably ill with the most unimaginable illness of thrashing around and kicking and contorting and growling, barking like dogs, throwing things against the wall. These two young girls, incidentally, happen to live in the home of Reverend Paris. They are his daughter and his niece, Abigail Williams. Young ladies, uh, 11 and 12 years old, something like that. And um, it's especially sort of ominous because it takes place in the (laughs) priest's home, the, the minister's home, rather. And when these young girls can't be sort of diagnosed with an earthly affliction, Um, It's then assumed that it must be the devil at work, that their affliction comes from the devil. And if it comes from the devil, then uh, there must be a witch um, in human form sort of perpetuating this this illness. And then what would the courts have seen as proof that someone was a witch? What was the evidence they took on board? Officially, evidence was looked for in the form of, let's say, a mark on the body. Um, I think we would probably call it a freckle or a birthmark today, but in 1692, if you had something like this on your body, it might prove, to the Puritan mind anyway, um, that this was a place where the devil nourished himself. So that was one physical way of proving. Uh, another would be simple hearsay by a neighbor. Now, it wasn't always taken into full, uh, full 100% credibility, but a neighbor's ill discussion about another neighbor might be proof enough to get a claim forwarded on witchcraft. So there were lots of different ways that they kind of thought they could prove someone was a witch. God, there's nothing behind it really. Do you know, someone's life was in their hands and something as simple as a birthmark and that was it. Indeed. Uh, and certainly the, the arguments that had been going on between families, as families do, as neighbours do, particularly in a place where everyone lives, uh, everyone is sort of dependent and interdependent on one another, um, that the, the uh, animosities that grow between people, human people, that they might then feed into any hysteria or any accusations of witchcraft. In other words, let's say you and I had an argument uh, 10 years ago, and now all of a sudden I heard a rumor that you were being accused of witchcraft. I might come forward and tell my community members that 10 years ago you and I had an argument and that somehow that might play into your guilt. Strange. It's, it's terrible. And what, what role then did the Indian Tichiba play in the trials? Well, certainly from the standpoint of Arthur Miller, who was the famous American playwright who wrote The Crucible, which uh, most American school children know is an allegory for what was happening here in our country in the 1950s with Senator McCarthy, um, that Arthur Miller's story of the Crucible starts with Tichuba being responsible in a very primary way, mm-hmm. that she's telling the girls stories, that her, her stories and witchcraft um, tales from her homeland of the Caribbean influence the girls somehow. But I think Arthur Miller, well, first we know that Arthur Miller's intention was never to be historically accurate. Mm. Um, so Tichuba has for a long time gotten sort of a bad rap. She, she didn't really start anything, but the fact that she was 
number one, um, a woman of color, and number two, a disenfranchised person, in other words, she was a slave, yeah. made her all the more suspect of being a witch in 1692. And then I always thought it was just women who were accused of witchcraft, but men were too. Sure, about 25% of people accused of witchcraft were men, particularly in the Salem witch trials, but certainly over most of the witch trials in European history, um, although we all know that it was more likely women that would be accused because, boy, ever since the Malleus Maleficarum, uh, it was said that women were weak. Women were weaker than men, and we could not, um, we can control ourselves, especially when seduced by the devil. Well, since the people of the village would have thought, you know, that these people were seduced by the devil, what happened to the bodies after they were hung? Uh, in the case of 1692, after the hangings, the bodies were typically cast down uh, an embankment and left uh, left to their own devices, they certainly were not granted a burial. Oh my God, that's horrific. And what was the, what was the aftermath? Like, when did they realize they were wrong and what they'd done to these poor people? Well, the, I, maybe it is the good news that this event didn't take a very long time to come to an end. It took about nine months by about September or October of 1692. The authorities had uh, sort of come to their senses. They'd seen this thing go completely out of control and yeah. ministers were arguing against the use of spectral evidence. So it takes about till October till things start to wind down. And uh, they, they, they work through the backlog of those who had been imprisoned for the next several months. But it doesn't happen until about 1711 that any sort of restitution is paid. And the irony of it all is that like even if they were witches, like witchcraft isn't about devil worship and it's quite the opposite. Indeed, that's my understanding as well, that modern, especially modern witchcraft, that they don't even identify such a deity. There's no devil in their religion to speak of. Now, Stacey, before I let you go, I just want to ask you, could you tell us about the museum itself, what people can expect when they go to visit you there? Sure. So what you see here in the museum is a presentation that takes place in a theater with 13 stage sets made to look like scenes from the witch trials and here you'd hear a dramatic telling of the overview of the trials in sort of simple and succinct terms so you can understand in a very brief time uh, the overview of what happened. Afterwards we guide our visitors through a short exhibit that looks at the notion of witchcraft in the ancient world, uh, how wise women and healers were then vilified later in the Middle Ages, how that evolution changes the, the view of witch, witches and stereotypes, and we talk about why we're still addressing the witch trials today in 2013. That sounds fantastic. And you have a website people can go to? Sure, it's SalemWitchMuseum.com. Perfect. Well, Stacey, thank you so much for coming on the show today. Thank you for having me. This is WRFM on 98.2. A little something for the weekend.